ladies and gentlemen, it's quite an honor for me to share with you some of my observations about the free trade zone and the deepening of China's opening up and reform. When President Xi and Prime Minister Li took the office in 2013, one of the first policy they introduced was a pilot of free trade zone in Shanghai. And after two years, this pilot was extended to Tianjin, Fujian, and Guangzhou. And I'd like to use this occasion to share with you my understanding why China introduced this pilot. And in the context of China's transition from a planned economy to a market economy, which started in 1979. As you know, when China transit from planned economy to a market economy, unlike other transition economy, they encounter collapse, stagnation, and a frequent crisis. China enjoy a sustained growth of average annual growth rate of 9.7% from the year 1979 up to 2014. And not only so, the trade in China grew at the rate of 16.4% continuously for 26 years. And with this kind of dramatic growth and a trade deepening, China became the second largest economy in 2009, overtook Japan. And in 2010, China overtook Germany to be the largest exporting country in the world. In 2013, China overtook US to be the largest trading country in the world. And a major by purchasing power parity. China overtook US in 2014 to be the largest economy in the world. And also during this 36 year period, seven million people get out of poverty and made a tremendous contribution to the global effort for the poverty reduction. And I think that might be one of the reasons why I became the chief economist of the World Bank. And how come the transition in other developing country and as former socialist country, they encounter collapse and a frequent crisis, and China enjoys such an extended period of growth and stability. In effect, China is still so far the only emerging market economy which did not encounter systematic crisis. And I think the reason it's because the approach to transition. We know that other socialist country in the transition, they adopted the Washington Consensus structural RP, tried to remove all the distortions simultaneously. However, a lot of the distortion was designed, were designed as a way to protect their old industry and so on. And uh, since those kind of distortions were endogenous, and uh, if you did not deal with the root cause of the distortion and try to remove the distortion, then the intention certainly was good, but the result was terrible. And uh, China adopted a very pragmatic way to do the transition. In 1979, Chinese government understand for the old industrial sector in heavy industries, a lot of them are state-owned enterprises because they were in sector which went against China's competitive advantage. At that time, China was a poor country. Capital was not China's advantages. And uh, those heavy industries, you know, they are in sector which went against China's competitive advantages. Firms in those kind of sectors were not viable in an open competitive market. So because of the pragmatism in China, the government continue to provide certain kind of transitionary protection and subsidy to them. 
at the same time, China liberalized the entry to the new sectors, which are light manufacturing sector, very, very intensive, are consistent with China's comparable advantages. Liberalize the entry to those kind of sectors. And this is so-called a dual track approach to transition. And uh, this dual track approach transition also apply to other dimensions, to the capital account liberalization, to the foreign direct investment. In the 1980s, 1990s and so on, at that time, the Chinese government encouraged the foreign direct investment to the sector of which China had competitive advantages and China liberalized the entry, that was the labor intensive sectors. But for the capital intensive sector, which was on a chance of competitive advantages, which there were many large scale strong enterprises there, and uh, to protect them, some kind of restriction for competition was desirable, so China prohibited foreign direct investment to the capital intensive advanced sectors. And uh, in line with this kind of approach, China liberalized the current account. The capital flow in the current account was liberalized. But Chinese government tightly controlled the capital account for the short-term capital flow. Those are the dual track gradual transition which allow China to enjoy stability and dynamic economic growth. But everything certainly has two sides. Every coin has two sides. The good thing about this very pragmatic gradual transition was the stability and dynamic economic growth as I just described. But the cost was a lot of social issues, specifically income disparity issues, corruption issues. And how come income disparity and corruption became a major issue in China was the need to protect the old heavy industries because they are in sector which went against China's comparative advantages. They are not viable. They require protection and subsidy to survive. And what kind of protection and subsidy was there? In general, were in financial sectors because they were capital intensive they require cheap capital in order to reduce their cost and to survive. And so China had a financial repression. And China's financial system was engineered to serve the needs of that. Many the big banks and the equity markets for those kind of things, they can provide financial services to large state owned enterprises. At the beginning, all of them are state owned gradually because of the dynamic growth in the light manufacturing sectors, some of them also group become very large, and they were large. They were able to receive the financial service from this kind of financial depression. And, uh, but even so far, about 60% of the production in China is still carried out by small agricultural households, by micro, small, or medium-sized enterprises in manufacturing sector or in services, and in general, they would not receive the financial services. Not only so, the, those big guys which can receive financial services from the current financial institution, they receive certain kind of subsidies because the capital costs were replaced. And who subsidized them? Those small guys who put the money into the financial system who could not receive the financial services. And they were poorer. And if you ask poor people to subsidize the growth of the rich people, certainly you are going to see the income disparity become larger and larger. Not only so. To get the financial service become a privilege, it, was, it is a rent because the cost was subsidized. And so there was rent there. And you know, if there's a rent, there's a rent seeking. And it's a neutral term by economists. But for a term understand by the ordinary people, that means corruption and uh, bribing, right? So that causing the income disparity and widespread corruption. And a similar situation is also in the natural resources sectors and a large scale service sector like telecommunication, like financial services. 
they have monopoly position, then they have a monopoly rent. If they have a monopoly rent, then you're going to have rent seeking and income distribution issue and also the corruption dimensions. And those are the main challenges in the Chinese economy in spite of very dramatic growth in the past three decades. And currently, China is an up to middle income country. Last year, 2015, I think the per capita income in China will be around 8,000 US dollars. Certainly, China aspires to be a high income country. And to be a high income country, China needs to continue furthering the reform in order to reduce the income disparity, in order to contain the corruption and so on. And uh, so that is the intention for the further reform in China. And I think also it's time to get rid of the legacy of this kind of dual track transition. The main reason that China needed to have this kind of distortion and subsidies was because in the 1980s, 1990s, China was a poor country. Actually, China did not cross the hurdle, the threshold of middle income country by the time of 20, 2001, before that China was a low income country. In a low income country, certainly capital intensive sector was not China's compared advantages. Now China is an up to middle income country. So capital was not so scarce anymore. And uh, so the firm in the capital intensive sectors, in the past, they went against China's competitive advantages. Now, most of them have been consistent with China's competitive advantages. If they are consistent with China's competitive advantages, firm in those kind of sectors should be viable in an open competitive market without the government protection and subsidies. Certainly, those of them would be happy to receive the subsidies continuously. However, the cost for the economy was the income inequality and the corruption and so on. So there are some political costs there. And with the understanding, the Chinese government under the leadership of President Xi started to have the third plan of the 18th Party's Congress in 2013. And uh, in the plan, the goal was to deepen the market-oriented reform and allow the market to play a decisive role. That means what? All the prices, including the factor prices in the financial sectors or in the resources sectors, should be determined by market competition. And resource allocation should be determined by the market demand and the market supply. And that is the idea behind the so-called allow the market to play a decisive role in the resource allocation. But as I mentioned, this kind of dual track transition is not only in the resource allocation and the price determination. It also related to the capital flow in China for direct investment. In the past, because the needs to protect the heavy industry, which was crucial for national defense and so on, and other large scale state owned enterprises. So foreign direct investment in those kind of sectors was prohibited. Foreign direct investment was only allowed to go into the light manufacturing sector, which China had competitive advantages. Now, with the situation changes, the, the policy towards foreign direct investment from the prohibition with a big list or from a positive list now change it to a common practice in the world, the so-called negative list. Unless a small selected industry which are related to national defense, and like any other country, certainly China still want to have some kind of control of those kind of sectors. And all other sectors which are not on the negative list should be open to the foreign direct investment. And also, in the past, for the financial stability and also incomparable to the foreign direct investment policies, China has a restriction in the capital flow, capital account. Cap current accounts has been liberalized, but capital account is also continue to be 
control. And so the free trade zone is a pilot, is a policy designed to experiment the negative list and the free capital flow. And uh, certainly, this kind of capital accountabilization is some risk involved. Anything related to capital, anything related to financial sectors can be very sensitive as we observed in China in the last few days. And so as a pragmatic government and also follow this kind of pilot experiment to see how it function. And if it perform well, we extend that to a larger places in China. And so in 2013, the first free trade zone was introduced as an experiment for this kind of investment policy necklace and also capital accountability. And after two years pilot, the policy has been extended to Tianjin, Fujian, and Guangzhou for further pilot experiment. And if the result overall are good and the impact are manageable, then it will be extended to the whole nation. So with this, I think that free trade zone and also the deepening of market reform is a direction to allow China to become a oil function market economy, a oil function functioning market economies. And I think that this is a decided direction for the reform in China. And uh, so overall, if China, after this experiment and, exp and, uh, and the extension of the policy to the whole nation, and uh, everyone concerned is that what kind of growth scenario China will be in the coming years. And that related to the 13 five-year plan that China is going to adopt by March in the Congress this year. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about the growth rate in China. And uh, for the outline of the 13 five-year plan, the central party did not specifically you know, mention about the growth target. But later on, the prime ministers in a public speech said, in the 2016 up to 2020, this 13 five-year plan period, the growth target in China should be 6.5% and above. And this growth target compared to the average 9.7% growth, it's about 30% downward adjustment. But many people still have concern whether China will be able to achieve this growth target, even with a much better market conditions. It's because from the first quarter 2010, the growth rate in China continued to decelerate. And uh, now it has been decelerated for six years. And uh, you, know, the, you know, the third quarter and the first quarter last year, likely the growth rate will be around 6.9%, less than 7%. And uh, the downward pressure is still very heavy. So that's the reason why people is thoughtful about whether China will be able to achieve the 6.5% and above growth rate. And uh, for me, if we want to understand whether China will be able to you know, achieve the growth target, we need to understand what is the main reason for the deceleration in China for such a long time. And uh, some people are pessimistic about the growth prospect in, the, in China. It's because they think the deceleration is mainly due to internal structural growth model issues. And uh, I think that China is a transition economy. Certainly, China has a lot of structural internal problems. However, I think the deceleration since the beginning of 2010 is mainly due to external and uh, cyclical issues. And the way to prove that is not so hard because we can see all other emerging market economy at the same level of China's development. They also experienced similar deceleration since the first quarter of 2010, and in effect, their deceleration was even sharper 
than China. And not only other emerging market economy, we can see other high income, high performing economies like Korea, like Singapore. Similarly, their growth started to decelerate from the beginning of 2010 and up to now, and that this deceleration was also even sharper than China. They were high income, high performing economies. They were supposed not to have so much internal structural or growth pattern problems, but they had similar performance. So this proved, in effect, the deceleration was mainly due to the external and the cyclical. The external issue is because high income country has not fully recovered from the crisis of 2008. So the demand in the high income country grew very sluggish and the export to the high income country certainly reduced substantially. As I mentioned, export in China in the past three decades, on the average the growth rate was 16% and above. But last year, the growth rate of trade, uh, export, was less than two, what was a negative 2%. So that is one reason for the deceleration in the growth. And the second, in 2008 financial crisis, every country adopts certain kind of fiscal expansion to support investment. And those kind of investment projects has been complete after five or six years. And without new investment project, certainly investment is going to slow down again. And I think those are the main reasons why so many countries, you know, no matter they were high income, or their middle income, as long as Expo is important component of their growth, then they have a deceleration. And under this kind of situation, I think that if we want to understand the growth prospect for China, we need to understand the first one, high income country may continue to have a very sluggy growth in the coming years, and China need to turn more into the internal you know, sources of growth. And I think that for the internal sources of growth, China has a very good opportunity because China is a middle income country. Even with many excess capacity in the existing sectors, China still have good opportunity for industrial upgrading. Those are good investment. Secondly, China can further improve the infrastructure. China can also invest in environmental protection. China also needs to you know, complete its you know, urbanization process because currently the urbanization rate in China is only 50% of the population in high income countries. In general, they have 80% or more population in urban areas. All those are good investment opportunities. And these investment opportunities was something, was something that China as a middle income country differ from other high income countries. Other high income countries, whenever they have a deceleration in their growth, they have a recession, it's very hard for them to find good investment opportunity. China is a middle income country. China still has many, many good investment opportunities. If you have good investment opportunities, you also need to have resources for making investment. And for this, China is also in a very good position because fiscal deficit in China it's less than 60% of GDP, among the lowest in the world. And as household saving in China is around 50% of GDP, among the highest in the world. And if you want to make investments, certainly you need to have the you know, importing equipment, technology, raw material, you need to have foreign reserve. China has 3.5 trillion US dollars, among the highest in the world. So these conditions make China differ from other developing countries. So with a good investment opportunity and a good investment resources, I'm sure in 2016 and in a certain five year period, uh, five, five year plan period, China will be able to maintain reasonably high growth rate of investment. With investment, it creates demand, it creates job, household income will continue to rise, and the consumption will also continue to rise. And with reasonable rate of investment growth and consumption growth, even the overall global economy may be sluggish. I think China will be able to maintain 6.5% growth with the deepening of the reform in China. Thank you. Well, we, 
we have a very brief time for, for some questions. If, if you're saying it's, m it's mostly cyclical or it's entirely cyclical or it's part cyclical, part structural, how would you allocate kind of percentages if you're talking about the slowdown? What part is based upon kind of cyclical downturn and what part is based upon the model just needs to change in order to sustain growth? Well, answer your question because you can look into those countries which do not have much internal structural problem, like Singapore, like Korea. In 2010, the Singapore growth rate was 15.2%. In 2014, Singapore growth rate was 2.9%. And uh, in 2010, Korea growth rate was 6.5%. In 2014, Korea growth rate was 3.3%. How much of them, this kind of decline in their growth rate was due to the structural problem? They were considered high performing, high income, high performing, export oriented economies. And so for them, certainly, the deceleration was mainly cyclical and external. And so for me, I think the deceleration in China is mainly cyclical and uh, external. Certainly, we, sometimes people confuse. China is a transition economy. So China certainly have the structural problem. China certainly has some kind of growth pattern problem because now wage rate in China increase. China need to transform from labor intensive oriented industry to more capital intensive oriented industries. Those kind of forces certainly are there, but they have been there always. So I would say that deceleration is mainly external and a secret code. If you want to achieve a figure to that, I would say it is 80%. 80-20. Yeah. Has the free trade zone experiment, I mean, you've laid the foundation for why yeah. it's going on. You th is it perceived as successful, failure? It's going to expand to the rest of the country? Well, my analysis also already answered your question because in 2013 there was only one free trade zone, Shanghai. And after two years experiment, they extend that to three other places, Tianjin, Fujian, and Guangzhou. So you're saying it's successful? Successful. Even yeah. though the capital flow through it is quite limited? Uh, well, Obo is controllable. Obo is manageable, yeah. Time for one question from the audience, then we need to move to the next panel. Uh, right here? Can't see who that is. Uh, wait for a microphone, please. And then if we can have the next, uh, I guess the next panel is ready. Make it very brief. Okay, thank you for the um, speech. That's very interesting. You mentioned the uh, physical deficit in China is very low at the moment. Um, but Mr. Liang just now just also mentioned leverage ratio of uh, governments and the SOEs and related bodies actually have a very high leverage. Um, is this, do, you, do you see a balance for the governments or the economy to um, to provide the resource for investment activities, do you think at the high leverage, government can actually boost the investment <coughs> to another level? Thank you. I think that uh, high leverage in the corporate sector is quite high, but that's not unique to China. For a country which their financial structure is bank-based, then under the kind of situation, certainly the leverage of the corporate sector will be higher than equity-based financial structure. And whether this kind of leverage is sustainable or not, very much depends on the growth prospect. If you can continue to manage a reasonably high growth, then the high leverage is not a problem. But certainly, if you have a very sharp contraction, a sharp recession, then high leverage can be a problem. And so that's the reason why I think to understand the growth prospect and the ability for the macro policy to maintain reasonably high growth rate would be a crucial sign to understand the future of China. Justin, thank you. Yeah. Okay.